Hi everyone, Mrs. Wilson here. Happy Friday wishes I'm sending out to you. Uh, it's an especially great one because it's a Friday before a three day weekend. And so when we left off reading the chapter called The Dementor, um, Harry had arrived at the castle, survived the whole ordeal with the Dementor, um, spoke with Professor McGonagall, went to the, the welcoming feast, and everyone had just joined all of the Gryffindors in um, going back to the dormitory so that they could get themselves settled in for their first night at Hogwarts. And so I'm just going to recap the very last paragraphs before we continue into chapter six, which is titled Talons and Tea Leaves, which is again, very long. So we'll be reading half of it today and, the, and we'll finish it up on Monday. Through the portrait hole and across the common room, the girls and boys divided toward their separate staircases. Harry climbed the spiral stair with no thought in his head except how glad he was to be back. They reached their familiar circular dormitory with its five four-poster beds, and Harry, looking around, felt he was home at last, which is a really good feeling. So in chapter six, um, we're going to find out what the talons and the tea leaves have to do with what's happening during this third year for Harry. When Harry, Ron, and Hermione entered the Great Hall for breakfast the next day, the first thing they saw was Draco Malfoy, who seemed to be entertaining a large group of Slytherins with a very funny story. As they passed, Malfoy did a ridiculous impression of a swooning fit, and there was a roar of laughter. Ignore him, said Hermione, who was right behind Harry. Just ignore him. It's not worth it. Hey, Potter, shrieked Pansy Parkinson, a Slytherin girl with a face like a pug. Potter, the Dementors are coming, Potter. Ooh. Harry dropped into a seat at the Gryffindor table next to George Weasley. New third year course schedule, said George, passing them over. What's up with you, Harry? Malfoy, said Ron, sitting down on George's other side and glaring at the Slytherin table. George looked up in time to see Malfoy pretending to faint with terror again. That little git, he said calmly. He wasn't so cocky last night when the Dementors were down at our end of the train. Came running into our compartment, didn't he, Fred? Nearly wet himself, said Fred, with a contemptuous glass at glance at Malfoy. I wasn't too happy myself, said George. They're horrible things, those Dementors. Sort of freeze your insides, don't they, said Fred. You didn't pass out, though, did you, said Harry in a low voice. Forget it, Harry, said George bracingly. Dad had to go out to Azkaban one time. Remember, Fred? And he said it was the worst place he'd ever been. He came back all weak and shaking. They suck the happiness out of a place, Dementors. Most of the prisoners go mad in there. Anyway, we'll see how happy Malfoy looks after our first Quidditch match, said Fred. Gryffindor versus Slytherin. First game of the season, remember? The only time Harry and Malfoy had faced each other in a Quidditch match, Malfoy had definitely come off worse. Feeling slightly more cheerful, Harry helped himself to sausages and fried tomatoes. Hermione was examining her new schedule. Oh, good. We're starting some new subjects today, she said happily. Hermione said, frown, Ron frowning as he looked over her shoulder. They've messed up your schedule. Look, they've got you down for about 10 subjects a day. There isn't enough time. I'll manage. I fixed it all with Professor McGonagall. But look, said Ron, laughing. See this morning, 9 o'clock divination, and underneath, 9 o'clock muggle studies. And... Ron leaned closer to the schedule, disbelieving. Look underneath that. Arithmancy, nine o'clock. I mean, I know you're good, Hermione, but no one's that good. How are you supposed to be in three classes at once? Don't be silly, said Hermione shortly. Of course I won't be in three classes at once. Well then, pass the marmalade, said Hermione. But, oh, Ron, what's it to you if my schedule's a bit full, Hermione snapped. I told you, I fixed it all with Professor McGonagall. Just then Hagrid entered the Great Hall. He was wearing his long moleskin overcoat and was absentmindedly swinging a dead polecat from one enormous hand. All right, he said eagerly, pausing on the way to the staff table. You're in my first ever lesson, right after lunch. Been up since five getting everything ready. Hope it's okay. Me, a teacher, honestly. He grinned broadly at them and headed off to the staff table, swinging, still swinging the polecat. Wonder what he's been getting ready, said Ron, a note of anxiety in his voice. 
The hall was starting to empty as people headed off toward their first lesson. Ron checked his course schedule. We better go. Divination's at the top of North Tower. It'll take us 10 minutes to get there. They finished their breakfast hastily, said goodbye to Fred and George, and walked back through the hall. As they passed the Slytherin table, Malfoy did yet another impression of a fainting fit. The shouts of laughter followed Harry into the entrance hall. The journey through the castle to the North Tower was a long one. Two years at Hogwarts hadn't taught them everything about the castle, and they'd never been inside North Tower before. There's got to be a shortcut, Ron panted as they climbed their seventh long staircase and emerged on an unfamiliar landing where there was nothing but a large painting of a bare stretch of grass hanging on the stone wall. I think it's this way, said Hermione, peering down the empty passage to the right. Can't be, said Ron. That's south. Look, you can see a bit of the lake out of the window. Harry was watching the painting. A fat, dapple gray pony had just ambled onto the grass and was grazing nonchalantly. Harry was used to the subjects of Hogwarts paintings moving around and leaving their frames to visit one another, but he always enjoyed watching it. A moment later, a short, squat knight in a suit of armor clanked into the picture after his pony. By the look of the grass stains on his metal knees, he had just fallen off. Aha, he yelled, seeing Harry, Ron, and Hermione. What villains are these that trespass upon my private lands? Come to scorn at my fall, perchance. Draw, you knaves, you dogs. They watched in astonishment as the little knight tugged at his sword out of its scabbard and began brandishing it violently, hopping up and down in rage. But the sword was too long for him. A particularly wild swing made him overbalance and he landed face down in the grass. Are you all right? said Harry, moving closer to the picture. Get back, you scurvy braggart, back, you rogue. The knight seized his sword again and used it to push himself back up, but the blade sank deeply into the grass, and though he pulled with all his might, he couldn't get it out again. Finally, he had to stop back down, flop back down onto the grass and push up his visor to mop his sweating face. Listen, said Harry, taking advantage of the knight's exhaustion. We're looking for the North Tower. You don't know the way, do you? A quest! The knight's rage seemed to vanish instantly. He clanked to his feet and shouted, Come, follow me, dear friends, and we shall find our goal, or else shall perish bravely in the charge. He gave the sword another fruitless tug, tried and failed to mount the fat pony, gave up and cried, On foot then, good sirs and gentle lady, on, on. And he ran, clanking loudly, into the left side of the frame and out of sight. They hurried after him along the corridor, following the sound of his armor. Every now and then they spotted him running through a picture ahead. Be of stout heart. The worst is yet to come, yelled the knight. And they saw him reappear in front of an alarmed group of women in crinolines, whose picture hung on the wall of a narrow spiral staircase. Puffing loudly, Harry, Ron, and Hermione climbed the tightly spiraling steps, getting dizzier and dizzier, until at last they heard the murmur of voices above them and knew they had reached the classroom. Farewell, cried the knight, popping his head into a painting of some sinister-looking monks. Farewell, my comrades in arms. If ever you have need of noble heart and steely sinew, call upon Sir Cadogan. Yeah, we'll call you, muttered Ron as the knight disappeared, if we ever need someone mental. They climbed the last few steps and emerged onto a tiny landing where most of the class was already assembled. There were no doors off this landing, but Ron nudged Harry and pointed at the ceiling where there was a circular trap door with a black brass plaque on it. Sybil Trelawney, divination teacher, Harry read. How are we supposed to get up there? As though, in answer to his question, the trap door suddenly opened and a silver ladder descended right at Harry's feet. Everyone got quiet. After you, said Ron, grinning, so Harry climbed the ladder first. He emerged into the strangest-looking classroom he had ever seen. In fact, it didn't look like a classroom at all. More like a cross between someone's attic and an old-fashioned tea shop. At least 20 small circular tables were crammed inside it, all surrounded by chintz armchairs and fat little poofs. Everything was lit with a dim crimson light. The curtains at the windows were all closed, and the many lamps were draped with dark red scarves. It was stiflingly warm, and the fire that was burning under the crowded mantelpiece was giving off a heady, heavy, sickly sort of perfume as it heated a large copper kettle. 
The shelves running along the circular walls were crammed with dusty looking feathers, stubs of candles, many packs of tattered playing cards, countless silvery crystal balls, and a huge array of teacups. Ron appeared at Harry's shoulder as the class assembled around them, all talking in whispers. Where is she? said Ron. A voice suddenly came out of the shadows, a soft, misty sort of voice. Welcome, it said. How nice to see you in the physical world at last. Harry's immediate impression was of a large glittering insect. Professor Trelawney moved into the firelight and they saw that she was very thin. Her large glasses magnified her eyes to several times their natural size and she was draped in a gauzy spangled shawl. Innumerable chains and beads hung around her spindly neck and her arms and hands were encrusted with bangles and rings. Sit, my children, sit, she said, and they all climbed awkwardly into armchairs or sank onto poofs. Harry, Ron, and Hermione set themselves around the same round table. Welcome to divination, said Professor Trelawney, who had seated herself in a winged armchair in front of the fire. My name is Professor Trelawney. You may not have seen me before. I find that descending too often into the hustle and bustle of the main school clouds my inner eye. Nobody said anything to this extraordinary pronouncement. Professor Trelawney delicately arranged her shawl and continued. So you have chosen to study divination, the most difficult of all magical arts. I must warn you at the outset that if you do not have the sight, there is very little I will be able to teach you. Books can take you only so far in this field. At these words, both Harry and Ron glanced, grinning at Hermione, who looked startled at the news that books wouldn't be much help in this subject. Many witches and wizards, talented though they are in the areas of loud bangs and smells and sudden disappearings, are yet unable to penetrate the veiled mysteries of the future. Professor Trelawney went on, her enormous gleaming eyes moving from face to nervous face. It is a gift granted to few. You, boy she said suddenly to Neville, who almost toppled off his poof. Is your grandmother well? I think so, said Neville trem tremulously. I wouldn't be so sure if I were you, dear, said Professor Trelawney, the firelight glinting on her long emerald earrings. Neville gulped. Professor Trelawney continued placidly. We will be covering the basic methods of divination this year. The first term will be devoted to reading the tea leaves. Next term, we shall progress to palmistry. By the way, my dear, she shot suddenly at Pravardi Patil, beware a red-haired man. Pravardi gave a startled look at Ron, who was right behind her, and edged her chair away from him. <laughs> In the second term, Professor Trelawney went on, we shall progress to the crystal ball, if we have finished our fire omens, that is. Unfortunately, classes will be disrupted in February by a nasty bout of flu. I myself will lose my voice. And around Easter, one of our numbers will leave us forever. A very tense silence followed this pronouncement, but Professor Trelawney seemed unaware of it. I wonder, dear, she said to Lavender Brown, who was nearest and shrank back into her chair, if you could pass me the largest silver teapot. Lavender looked relieved, stood up, took an enormous teapot from the shelf and put it down on the table in front of Professor Trelawney. Thank you, my dear. Incidentally, that thing you were dreading, it will happen on Friday, the 16th of October. Lavender trembled. Now I want you to divide into pairs. Collect a teacup from the shelf, come to me and I will fill it, then sit down and drink. Drink until only the dregs remain. Swill these around the cups three times with the left hand, then turn the cup upside down on its saucer. Wait for the last of the tea to drain away, then give your cup to your partner to read. You will interpret the patterns using pages five and six of Unfogging the Future. I shall move among you, helping and instructing. Oh, and dear, she caught Neville by the arm as he made to stand up. After you've broken your first cup, would you be so kind as to select one of the blue pattern ones? I'm rather attached to the pink. Sure enough, Neville had no sooner reached the shelf of teacups when there was a tinkle of breaking china. Professor Trelawney swept over to him holding a dustpan and brush and said, 
One of the blue ones, then, dear, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Then Harry and Ron had their teacups filled. They went back to their table and tried to drink the scalding tea quickly. They swilled the dregs around as Professor Trelawney had instructed, then drained the cups and swapped them. Right, said Ron, as they both opened their books to page five and six. What can you see in mine? A load of soggy brown stuff, said Harry. The heavily performed perfumed smoke in the room was making him feel sleepy and stupid. Broaden your minds, my dears, and allow your eyes to see past the mundane, Professor Trelawney cried through the gloom. Harry tried to pull himself together. Right, you got a crooked sort of cross, he consulted on fogging the future. That means you're going to have trials and suffering. Sorry about that. But there's a thing that could be the sun. Hang on, that means great happiness. So you're going to suffer, but be very happy. You need your inner eye tested if you ask me, said Ron, and they both had to stifle their laughs as Professor Trelawney gazed in their direction. My turn, Ron peered into Harry's teacup, his forehead wrinkled with effort. There's a blob a bit like a bowler hat, he said. Maybe you're gonna go work for the Ministry of Magic. He turned the teacup another way. But this way it looks more like an acorn. What's that? He scanned his copy of Unfogging the Future. A windfall expected, unexpected gold. Excellent, you can lend me some. And there's a thing here. He turned the cup again. That looks like an animal. Yeah, if that was it had, it looks like a hippo. No, a sheep. Professor Trelawney whirled around as Harry let out a snort of laughter. Let me see that, my dear, she said reprovingly to Ron, sweeping over and snatching Harry's cup from him. Everyone went quiet to watch. Professor Trelawney was staring into the teacup, rotating it counterclockwise. The falcon, my dear, you have a deadly enemy. But everyone knows that, said Hermione in a loud whisper. Professor Trelawney stared at her. Well, they do, said Hermione. Everybody knows about Harry and you know who. Harry and Ron stared at her with a mixture of amazement and admiration. They'd never heard Hermione speak to a teacher like that before. Professor Trelawney chose not to reply. She lowered her huge highs to Harry's cup again and continued to turn it. The club, an attack, dear, dear, this is not a happy cup. I thought that was a bowler hat, said Ron sheepishly. The skull, danger in your path, my dear. Everyone was staring, transfixed at Professor Trelawney, who gave the cup a final turn, gasped, and then screamed. There was another tinkling of breaking china. Neville had smashed his second cup. Professor Trelawney sank into a vacant armchair, her glittering hand at her heart, and her eyes closed. My dear boy, my poor dear boy. No, it is kinder not to say. No, don't ask me. What is it, Professor, said Dean Thomas at once. Everyone had got to their feet, and slowly they crowded around Harry and Ron's table, pressing closer to Professor Trelawney's chair to get a good look at Harry's cup. My dear, Professor Trelawney's huge eyes opened dramatically. You have the grim. The what, said Harry. He could tell that he wasn't the only one who didn't understand. Dean Thomas shrugged at him and Lavender Brown looked puzzled, but nearly everybody else clapped their hands to their mouths in horror. The Grimm, my dear, the Grimm, cried Professor Trelawney, who looked shocked that Harry hadn't understood. The giant spectral dog that haunts churchyards, my dear boy. It is an omen, the worst omen of death. Harry's stomach lurched. That dog on the cover of Death Omens and Flourish and Blots? The dog in the shadows of Magnolia Crescent? Lavender Brown clapped her hands to her mouth too. Everyone was looking at Harry except Hermione, who had gotten up and moved around to the back of Professor Trelawney's chair. I don't think it looks like a grim, she said flatly. Professor Trelawney survived Hermione with mounting dislike. You'll forgive me for saying so, my dear, but I perceive very little aura around you, very little receptivity to the resonances of the future. Seamus Finnegan was tilting his head from side to side. 
It looks like a grim if you do this, he said with his eyes almost shut. But it looks more like a donkey from here, he said, leaning to the left. When you've all finished deciding whether I'm going to die or not, said Harry, taking even himself by surprise, now nobody seemed to want to look at him. Oh, I think we will leave the lesson here for today, said Professor Trelawney in her mistiest voice. Yes, please pack away your things. Silently, the class took their teacups, teacups back to Professor Trelawney, packed away her books, closed their bags. Even Ron was avoiding Harry's eyes. Until we meet again, said Professor Trelawney faintly, fair fortune be yours. Oh, and dear, she pointed at Neville, you'll be late next time, so mind you, work extra hard to catch up. Harry, Ron, and Hermione descended Professor Trelawney's ladder and the winding stair in silence, then set off for Professor McGonagall's transfiguration lesson. It took them so long to find her classroom that early as they'd left divination, they were only just in time. And that is where we're going to leave off in the chapter. So, um, first of all, Professor Trelawney is quite an interesting new addition to the characters in the story, for sure. Um, and I'm just wondering how reliable of a source that she is. I'm hoping not so reliable for certain. And I'm also wondering what um, Professor McGonagall is going to be teaching them in Transfiguration now that they are in their third year. I think probably some really exciting transformations, um, I would assume. In the meantime, I hope that your Friday is going fantastically and that you have an incredibly awesome three-day weekend. I will still um, read with you on Monday. So um, we'll take a little break over the weekend and then I shall see you guys back on Monday. And until then, I will be counting the minutes. I can't wait to read together again. Take care. And happy Memorial Day.